The Namib Desert, a parched land that spans a vast area, the entirety of Namibia's west coast. Certain sand dunes here bear a striking resemblance to some of those found on the surface of Mars. Consequently, NASA has officially named several Martian dunes after dunes within the Namib. As one of the driest places on Earth, parts of the Namib can be seemingly devoid of life. However, life does exist here. Here, life can be as otherworldly as the landscapes themselves. Over the course of countless millennia, life has adapted to thrive in this arid wilderness. Many of the plants and animals found here are endemic, found nowhere else on Earth. One such creature, however, is immediately recognisable to all. The ant. Ants are some of the most numerous creatures on all of planet Earth and the most abundant of the social insects. Ants are found on every continent except Antarctica. Their reach even extending to the Namib Sand Sea. Wandering these dunes, the aptly named Namib Dunam Camponotus detritus can be found. The ants make a comfortable living here. Food and moisture is plentiful for those who know where to find it. What seem to be dry grass stems actually provides ample food and shelter. Dune ants mainly subsist on honeydew, excretion from aphids and scale insects, which are commonly found on this dry vegetation. Pollen, nectar and dead animal material are also part of the dune ants diet. One behaviour that aids the ants in their survival is trophallaxis, the exchange of regurgitated liquids between adult insects. This apparently revolting behaviour can be observed between many ant species the world over, not just in dune ants of the Namib. And as gruesome as it sounds, moisture is always welcome in the hyper-arid desert. Professor Christian Peters and his colleagues, experts on ants, have travelled here to search for a dune ant queen for their studies. So we're looking at um, various species of ants and studying their adaptations to desert life. So ants can do very well in deserts because they are social insects. And so they have an advantage over solitary insects because there are so many laboring individuals that they can dig nests. And having a long lasting nest is a great adaptation for living in, in a desert because that means you can actually get away from the heat 
you can go deep, go to where there is moisture, and you know, that's where you are going to look after the queen and the many eggs, larvae, and pupae. The ants that you see on the surface are only a very small fraction of the colony. These are the older individuals that are looking for food, looking for honeydew from the scale insects on the grass, and sometimes carrying back dead insects as well. We want to bring back a colony in Belgium for the, in the lab. So we need a queen to, uh, for her to lay eggs in captivity to a captive colony that can continue and thrive. If you don't have a queen, there is no one that can lay eggs and the colony will just collapse in a few months. So basically we're trying to find the queen of the Campanotis colony. But colonies are huge, thousands of workers trying to defend their home. The workers buy, are biting us and it's not easy. <laughs> it's a bit tiring really in the desert. The great thing about insects living in societies is that they can collaborate when getting food to bring back to the nest. And to do this they need to communicate. And ants communicate using chemical signals, pheromones. And so usually when a, an older worker has found a food source, he will come back to the nest and lay a chemical trail, a pheromone trail on the ground. And then the other workers just need to follow this. But when you live in such an environment, because of the sand and because of the wind that blows the sand away, a pheromone trail is not ideal. And so ants such as Campanotus, uh, the, the dune ants, they really navigate using uh, visual means. And so either they memorize the landmarks or else they can actually read in the sky the, the pattern of polarized light. And this is the way they can forage quite a distance away from the nest and come back without getting lost. For the Namib Dunant, navigation by polarized sunlight is usually a sure means of not getting lost. Occasionally, however, the ants may wander into enemy territory, and this particular individual seems to have strayed far from her home colony. Unfortunately for her, Dune ants are extremely territorial, and the other ant senses from her pheromones that she is from another colony. Unusual pheromones usually result in hasty retreat or battle, and in this case, it's the latter. The two dune ants aggressively battle to pin each other to the scorching sand aiming to dehydrate and ultimately kill. One of the ants tucks her gaster underneath her body, aiming to spray formic acid. The strong grip of the attacker is momentarily loosened and a rare opportunity for escape presents itself. These brutal battles can take their toll on the ants and even the victor will often walk away severely battered and bruised. Not all are so lucky. As the day progresses and temperatures rapidly increase, many of the ants return to their nests. A whole host of other desert-dwelling creatures also shelter from the heat of the day by burrowing. Burrowing is a technique in which a variety of animals in the Namib, such as this solifuge, have adopted.
Weevils, such as this one, found only in the Namib, bury their larvae in the sand. This bee digs numerous burrows to camouflage the one that contains food provisions or its larvae. The intriguing thing about the Namib fauna is that almost everything, when they have to escape, whether they escape an enemy or the conditions, the wind conditions, temperature, whatever they don't like, they have to burrow. There's no, there's no vegetation, there's no trees, no grass, nothing like that at the microscope where they can go to. What you find in all deserts is that your desert animals tend to be burrowing animals. Certain species of an ancient creature have mastered a variety of burrowing techniques. Scorpions. Not all scorpions dig a burrow, and this particular, highly venomous species often shelters under rocks or in crevices. Although commonly feared and often vilified, most species pose little threat to humans. This Parabuthus velosus, however, is one of the most venomous species of scorpion found in the Namib. Scorpions are an important resident in arid ecosystems, playing a key role in food webs. Primitive species, such as this Europlectes, opt for shelter in the peeling bark of trees found in their thousands along the banks of often dry, ephemeral rivers. This abundance of cracked and desiccated bark is an anomaly in the desert. This river, the Kwiseb, traverses only a small section of the Namad Desert. But where it does occur, it provides ideal shelter. Scorpions are mostly nocturnal creatures, and as night falls, they begin to emerge. Some from behind rocks, others from beneath the bark of trees. Other species lie in wait, doorkeeping at their self-made burrows, patiently waiting for unsuspecting prey to wander by. In the darkness of night, Ultraviolet light reveals these secretive animals. They're normally cryptic colors obscured in the bright fluorescence. There are numerous theories as to why this happens. Attracting prey is one, allowing the creatures to know they are exposed is another. A helpful hint for these cannibalistic creatures. None of these theories have provided the answer. For now, the scorpion's glow remains a secret. Some species of scorpion use the environment around them to shelter, such as the Parabuthus velosus or the Europlectes tree bark scorpion. There are certain species, however, which create their own home. Here in the central Namib desert, a Gobabeb, a scientific research station with a history that dates back to over 50 years, Martin Han Jabba, a technician and researcher, has been studying the burrows of these incredible creatures.
Using UV light to locate nocturnal scorpions, Martin places pitfall buckets at the burrow entrances to harmlessly trap the scorpions before analysing their burrows. What we are doing right now is uh, we are casting the scorpion barrel. We have um, met metal aluminium and we uh, heat the metal aluminium in a crucible at over a thousand degrees and that melts. Now the liquid aluminium is the one that we pour down the barrel of the scorpion and it gives us a beautiful outline of the barrel and that blueprint of the barrel is the one that we are interested in. Now the reason why we are casting the scorpion barrel is because we can get a lot of data from that. Um, for example, we can uh, work how the uh, architecture of, of the barrel looks like, that's number one. But we can also get a few other parameters from it, for example the width of the barrel, the depth of the barrel. And from that we can work out how the barrel is very important in the, in the environment. Scorpions are carnivores and they do when through the eating of the uh, insects they take all the uh, insects and all the other um, organic matter down the barrels and that helps fertilize the soil in such an arid um, environment like the Namib Desert. Having safely removed the burrow occupants using a pitfall trap the day before, Martin must now wait for the cast to harden. So this is day two of our experiment. Um, so we are here to take out the cast that we made yesterday. It is cooled down and it is solidified, so we're just waiting to see what's under there. Um, so what, what's interesting about this burrow right here is there were two individuals caught, there were two individuals trapped and caught from this barrel. So we are really anxious to see what is underground there. So without wasting time right now, we just, let's just dig it out. Right, so uh, we've got our barrel <laughs> quite short. We expected it to be a little deeper than this, but nonetheless still interesting because if you look at this barrel here, you can um, see that there's a main chamber coming coming here from the entrance. And um, if you look closely, you'll see that that is the ground surface there where you have the Namibian coin there. That shows the ground surface and also shows the scale. But what's also interesting is that you'll see immediately from the main and from the main uh, chamber, from the main chamber there, that there is an extra chamber coming from the main chamber, and we don't really know what is um, why, why there is this chamber here. But as I said earlier, there were two individuals found from this barrel. Now the other thing is also, um, if you look at it, right at the end of this chamber, you will notice that there are some insect remains. If you look closely, now those insect remains often um, often mean that that is the end of the barrel. Because at the end of the barrel, that's all. That's where the uh, scorpion um, devours their prey, and that's where you find most of the insect um, remains. Um, it is a short uh, barrel, but it's still an interesting barrel, and we still want to uh, we, we still want to compare them and see their differences. Other species of scorpion can produce alternative burrow designs. This impressive spiraling structure descends almost a metre under the sand.
The flora and fauna living in the Namib have adapted to this environment over the course of thousands or even millions of years. Although rarely considered charismatic, insect life plays a crucial role in pollination and food webs. The cryptic colours and patterns on this grasshopper allow it to blend into its surroundings making it difficult for predators to notice it. This spider also displays extraordinary camouflage, perfectly blending in with the sand. Tall clumps of grass, Stipogrustus, are plentiful in parts of the sand sea. These islands of vegetation provide food and shelter for numerous insects, reptiles, birds and mammals. A variety of endemic tenebrionid beetle species have evolved to be perfectly adapted to life in the dunes. This diverse family of beetles feed on dead, dry and wind-blown plant material known as detritus. Onimacris planar this beetle's long legs lift its body away from the sandy surface, which has been known to reach over 70 degrees centigrade. A few extra millimetres of height makes all the difference at insect scale. It is also an extremely fast-running beetle. When running at top speed, its movement produces a convective cooling effect. Water is essential for life. This rule applies to even the hardiest of desert organisms. Here in the Namib, life must find creative ways in which to obtain moisture. For many of the animals, it is often obtained through food. However, some of the Namib's flora and fauna have adapted to exploit a rather special phenomenon. As the cold Benguela current flows alongside the warm western coast of southern Africa, clouds of fog regularly form. Numerous plants and animals depend on this fog as a vital source of moisture. A fog basking beetle places itself on the crest of a dune its body acting as a condensation unit. Fog droplets accumulate on its body and then trickle down into its mouth via narrow grooves in the shell. The nocturnal palmetto gecko, or webbed foot gecko, which mysteriously fluoresces extraordinary colors when exposed to ultraviolet light, can lick accumulated fog moisture from its eyeballs.
The gecko's webbed feet are perfectly adapted for digging burrows in the sand, but the purpose of the gecko's fluorescence under UV light is a mystery. Rainfall in deserts is notoriously unpredictable. Parts of the Namib see little to no rainfall for years at a time, making fog the primary and essential source of water. When it does finally rain here, it can be a dramatic event. Despite the sudden and copious amounts of rain, this rare local event does not flood this dry ephemeral river, the Kwisab. Rainfall some 200 kilometers away in the mountainous interior of Namibia floods the catchment area, pouring massive quantities of water down this tree-lined riverbed, transforming the dusty channel into a linear oasis. This infrequent flow, sometimes several years apart, halts the sand seas further northward march. The Kwiseb's dry river course forms the northern border of the Namib sand sea, an impassable barrier between the shifting sand dunes and the gravel plains. Despite such a large quantity of water, in mere days the scorching sun dries the riverbed once again. These ephemeral floods recharge the underground aquifer, enabling the growth of an abundance of plant life. The cracked bark of ancient trees withers in the harsh environment their roots extending many meters below the sandy surface to extract precious underground water. Some examples of true desert adapted plant life can be found further away from the river's revitalizing influence.
A Namib endemic, known as Nara, is a classic example of desert-adapted flora. Nara is leafless. It photosynthesizes through its long and thorny stems. Discarding large leaves is typical of many desert-adapted plants. This allows them to lower water loss by reducing leaf surface area. Nara is dioecious, meaning that there are separate male and female plants. It is the female plants that bear fruits, which for thousands of years has provided a valuable food source for the indigenous people of the land. Archaeological evidence indicates the earliest human use of Nara seeds dating back to some 8,000 years ago from a rock shelter located on the Namib's gravel plains. Found around 40 kilometers from the closest Nara plants, this rocky outcrop would have provided shelter from the merciless heat of the plains surrounding it. The Topnar, a small rural community who live along the Kwiseb River, still harvest the fruits of the Nara plant. The highly nutritious seeds are extracted from the fruit as a source of food and income, which is fundamental to the Topnar's cultural identity and lifestyle. Nara is not only a dependable source of food for humans, but also an incredibly important plant species for a variety of other organisms. Hummocks, the mounds of sand surrounding the plant, provide stable shelter. Nara stems and roots stabilize the surrounding sand, enabling creatures to dig burrows. The Nara plants is quite interesting as a keystone species in the, in the Namib because it collects sand and creates hummocks. But at the same time, uh, they have other attributes that makes them more, as important too. The males flower right through the year. The flowers don't last very long, only two or three days, and then they fall off. So they produce a lot of detritus. There's a lot of food around, around the Nara. Basically, the Nara hummock is a generator of plant food and primary production in the desert. At the same time, there's other attributes which would be interesting to find out how, how effective it is, like that the, it condenses fog, so you have water dripping from it, which provides a source of moisture, which in the desert is always important uh, for organisms to have sufficient moisture in order to, to develop. And then because you have then the, the, the two combination, food as well as water in one place, that becomes very attractive. Evergreen and continuously photosynthesizing, Nara is a constant source of food, especially useful to insects. Flies require the green vegetation where larvae can develop. The pollen-packed flowers attract nectar feeders of all kinds. Blister beetles are often found chewing the stems, which produces a sap that other creatures then feed upon. So what you have at the Nara Amok is this whole series of niches, of different type, type of niches, where, where, which can be inhabited by different organisms. Now, in this whole process, what you would expect is that through natural selection that you would start finding some specialists, that is, that you only find a Nara. And we think they are there, but at this stage we don't know about many. There's only one that we're quite sure of. It was only described some four years ago by David Barracliffe in, in, in Natal, which is a small fly. We call it the Nara fly. It's emerald green running around it. And it is a very small family of flies. 
and it's what we call a monotypical genus. There's, there's only one species in the genus, both the genus as well as, as the species, you only find a Nara. That's the only one that we're sure of. There's some other animals that you do find on it that people will tell you are specialists of Nara. Like one of them is a big ground cricket, a beautiful beast. Uh, some people think that they're very ugly. They call it the Nara cricket, but they're not Nara specialists. You actually find them right through the dunes. Nara has been utilised by inhabitants of the desert for millennia and in recent years been the subject of scientific investigation. Yet there is still much to learn and current ongoing research at Gobabeb hopes to unlock some of Nara's mysteries. So my project is to determine if the Nara plant utilizes fog as a source of water. And that's important in this hyper-arid environment because rain is so unpredictable and so scarce that plants and animals in this environment need to find a different source of water. So I'm trying to determine how Nara can use fog and dew as a source of water and if it really does require it as a source of water. Existing knowledge of Nara points to groundwater as the main source of water, and it is widely believed that its tap roots could reach up to 50 meters. However, many Nara plants grow far from obvious groundwater sources. The question is, do these populations utilize moisture from fog and dew? There's different methods for Nara to utilize fog. So it's also just maybe droplets dripping on the ground and being absorbed by the roots or some plants also have the ability to absorb water directly through their stems or through the leaves. So um, I've collected different Nara stem clippings of younger stems and then older stems um, just to determine in a lab experiment if it does absorb water directly through the stem. In the laboratory, fluorescein dye is mixed with fog water, which then fluoresces under ultraviolet light. With a humidifier to prevent evaporation, time-lapse photography reveals the stem's ability to directly absorb moisture. This discovery of fog absorption in Nara contradicts previous assumptions of the plant's reliance on groundwater. As science continues to delve deeper into the Namib's intricacies, nature's brilliance gradually becomes clearer, yet ever more complex and fragile. As is the case the world over, the physical adaptations of the flora and fauna are often representative of the environment they inhabit. 
We have learned that many arid adaptive plants have lost the large leaves of their temperate cousins. However, there is a plant endemic to the Namad that defies the ordinary. It is so unusual, yet perfectly adapted. Vorwichia mirabilis, a true living fossil. The interesting thing about Velvichia is that uh, the leaves seem to break the rules for what we would predict leaf sizes of plants in an environment like this to be. So uh, there's quite a bit of uh, work been done to predict the relationship between environment and leaf size. And one of the uh, conclusions from that work is that if you have a plant that's in a hot, sunny environment, that plant should produce leaves that are small numerous and narrow, uh, and here's Velvichia, it breaks the rules. These large leaves, uh, when you're dealing with a, a healthy, intact plant, provides an enormous uh, patch of shade and shelter underneath them, and this is a phenomenon that's called uh, niche construction. It's a, an organism actually building an environment in another environment. So you have these patches of shadiness and, and relatively cool temperatures under the canopy of the uh, Velvichia leaf. And this might not only help the Velvichia, for example, cooler temperatures will result in higher humidity. That'll mean less demand for water uh, on, on these plants to do what they need to do but it can also provide a shelter for other organisms that live around the velvet chia. And uh, this is a relatively unexplored area. And it's, in part, it's because niche construction is a relatively new way of thinking about adaptation and evolution. And uh, this may be why velvet chia leaves break the rules. The evolution of the angiosperms, the flowering plants, took place at the beginning of the Mesozoic period, some 250 million years ago. This period was when the amphibians' dominance of the Earth started to fade and the reptiles began to emerge. About a third of the way through the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs began to emerge, and it is widely believed that Velvichia came into existence around this time. They emerged first that we know from fossil evidence around about 200 million years ago. We believe that it was about 200 million years ago. They found Velvichia fossils in Brazil, uh, around about uh, 150, 160 million year old uh, deposits. They recognized the flowers, they recognized the cones, and they recognized also some of the pollen that is in, that, uh, in those deposits. Today, Velvichia is found only in the Namib Desert. The Brazilian fossils, however, are evidence of the plant's primordial existence first growing in a time prior to the existence of the Atlantic Ocean. South America and Africa were once connected in a vast continental area known as Gondwanaland. Around 130 million years ago, the gigantic landmass gradually broke up to form the Atlantic Ocean, separating populations of plants and animals. Here in Namibia, in this now extinct supervolcano known as Mesum Crater, many large and thus presumably ancient specimens of Velvichia can be found. Lichens cling to this giant, which stands almost six feet tall. Notoriously difficult to date, no one truly knows the age of any Velvichia specimens. Although scientists have estimated that a plant this size could be over 2,000 years old. Clearly, the adaptations of this extraordinary plant species have served it well throughout the ages.
18 kilometers in diameter. The giant Mesum Crater supervolcano was believed to be last active around the time of the continental breakup. Unique landscapes such as Mesum Crater speak to the wonders of the Namib Desert, a vast and primeval wilderness. Much of the Namib Desert still is wilderness, its conditions unfavorable to many, but not for the countless arid adapted organisms inhabiting it. The inhospitable desert, a false statement. Its inhabitants have shown us that it is anything but inhospitable. The adaptations of the Namib's flora and fauna arising over millennia in this fantastic and bizarre environment are true testaments to the diversity and resilience of life.